Good afternoon. This little performance that we've done here together and worked on together um, is one of the experiments that my son and I are carrying out, a number of experiments we're carrying out in the area of enabling disabled people to make music using technology. In order to understand how I and we got there, because we've been working together for about... Uh, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, in the 60s, I became to know Karlheinz Stockhausen and moved to Germany to be his assistant. And while I was working for him, um, I made all sorts of experiments, but I, I couldn't compose. I wanted to be a composer of electronic music. I couldn't compose because I was too busy, but I could fiddle around a bit. So I recorded all sorts of objects. We had tape recorders at that time already, and I modified the sounds, and I would transpose them octaves, eight octaves, and so on, did all sorts of experiments. And these kind of experiments, one day I got a commission from a museum in Germany to make a an installation of these experiments of different kinds of amplif ways of making sound. We used the little proprietary sound generators and strings on the walls and a big and a feedback net mechanism, acoustic feedback that encompassed the whole space with limiters and so forth. And I noticed very quickly that people just loved playing around with sound. Uh, I don't think any of them thought it was music, but they loved playing around with the sound. Um, these things, th this experience was very important for me because I noticed that people like to treat, treat sound as an object. Um, people started to make music, 
spontaneously. And they started creating little sequences of sounds and, and, and quasi-dialogues. So I concluded that as a result, that if you give people the right opportunity in the right environment, they will create something musical. During this time, I was composing. I had started to become a composer of electronic music, but I was actually making a living composing orchestral music. And, and, and the reason was that you couldn't make a living doing electronic music because people didn't go to concerts to listen to electronic music because it was being played back from tape recorders. So I thought about this quite a lot. Uh, in 1976, I began to use a computer as a composing tool. And after a few years of this, I wrote some software which I could while well, it was composing notes, I could influence it with a joystick. And then I had a flash. And I thought I would make an environment measuring the position and movement of people in a space. And by their being in the space, they would perform my music, my electronic music, which was in the form of a computer program. Um, this was great. You know, it worked beautifully. I even got the French Minister of Culture to pay for it. <laughs> it, was, it was installed in the Centre Pompidou and later in the Museum of Science and Technology. And, and then I started working with it. And I went to schools and, and worked with dancers and, and worked with, at one point, disabled children by accident. Some disabled children came into an installation I was doing and they went nuts. I couldn't believe it. You know, normally in installations, people were just standing around like these guys, you know, and listening and doing things. But when these kids came in, they started running around and jumping and throwing their crutches off to the side and all sorts of crazy stuff. And to me, this was, you know, this changed my life. Um, I, I hadn't expected this. Because I was a composer making music that people should listen to. And here I'd made something that people didn't give a damn about what I'd made. They just went into it and, and made music. And that was very important. I went on working with this for a long time. But the thing was that I had to change my, the way I was working. I could no longer just make this really beautiful abstract stuff like what we were doing here. Uh, you know, this was 25 years ago. I had to make something which was a bit more anchored so that people would be encouraged to interact and therefore create and control music that they could recognize as music. And Bakken has had quite a bit of experience in this, and he's going to tell you some things about that. Hello. Um, as well as music, I work in the fields of fine art installation and uh, product design as well. Whilst competing in Masters at the Royal College of Art, Yamaha asked uh, a bunch of us to design new musical instruments. Um, and there's a certain euphoria associated with musical performance. Um, this is apparent through improvisation mainly, when an accomplished player no longer has to think about the notes they're playing or the scale they're in or where they are on the instrument. They can reach this sort of higher plane. They can transcend into, a, transcend into like a really automatic, free-flowing, euphoric state. And it's this kind of area I was interested in giving to people without spending 10 years, or at least a glimpse of this, without spending however many years learning an instrument. And that was sort of a really important part of that. Um, and also to try and free them a little bit, because people are kind of stunted in their expression quite often. We all have a voice, but how many of us sing to each other daily? Very few. Um, another aim was to allow the player to really inhabit the sound they are creating, to feel the physics of the sound around them. So the furniture for the musical human is a self-contained vocal exploration instrument. <laughs> um, the player is invited to sit down, talk, sing, scream, hiss, yell into the microphone, and then on the joystick, there's a... me. <laughs> there's a complex array of effects and sort of world-twisting, strange kind of effects, kind of like what you heard today. 
that if you listen really, really carefully, the more you listen, the more noise you make, the more you play, and the more delicately you move the joystick, the more sound you hear, and the more you get out of the instrument, until suddenly you're in this weird zone, and an hour's gone by, and it's felt like a few minutes. So it's this kind of euphoric state I was trying to give to people. Um, and it's this, it's this kind of reaction to control over sound that really interests, interests me and the effect that it has on you when you're kind of in this weird controlling zone. So I'd like, can someone name a piece of music? Anyone? Shout out any piece of music. A track, a tune. Orbital. What was that? Orbital. Any track? Uh, Belfast. Good choice. Um, <laughs> many of us think that music is songs and tracks and pieces of music, recognisable tunes that allow us to relate emotionally. A song can make you feel a certain emotion, joy, sadness, despair, hope. But there's actually a lot more. And I'd like to introduce to you... Click. Click. The Huckins theory for all the music in the world, every creator today and in the future. <laughs> <laughs> it's very simple, it goes like this. In music you have sonics on one end. It's the physical... I'm going to have to read this because it gets really technical. The physical manifestation of sound. The pitch... Oh, sorry. And you have nostalgia on the other side. So it's sonics versus nostalgia. Really simple. Ends of the spectrum. You have pitch, you have tone, you have volume, and you have timbre. You have how the sound is generated, how it arrives at your ear. And we all, knew, we all know like low frequencies can rock your chest and face. In extreme cases, you get chronic diarrhea reported from owners of big bass, <laughs> big bass car sound systems. They've got for the rest of their life. It's dreadful. Sound can be seen as physical in two ways. One, the air is vibrating. It vibrates with your eardrum, which resonates with this vibration. Sound goes into your brain. Your brain tries to interpret the sound, sending waves of feelings into your body, into your limbs and organs, creating a physical feeling. Hair stand up on the back of your neck. Where's your neck? There. <laughs> um, and your heart can slow or speed up to match a rhythm. And these are the human instincts uh, in correlation to sound. After all, as an ancient species, the first sounds we encountered would have been prey or predators or your family members. So essentially, people you're trying to keep alive, things that are going to kill you or things that you want to kill. So it's all pretty primal. What about nostalgia? Nostalgia is the fondness and the yearning for things past. There is, however, nostalgia for the future, but that's a really big something else. So we're not going to go into that. You feel nostalgia when you see an old family photo or indeed when you hear a Buddy Holly song. So these kind of things make you emote. So our experience has become dust through image and film. We relate to things. You don't have to have lived the experience to relive it. It can, it can reference you. In some cases, automatically and involuntarily. And involuntarily, that's really important. This is the forced nostalgia of music. For example, soul music, Motown, love songs. For example, you could be feeling any number of emotions when a drippy love song comes on the radio and you're wrenched into a place you didn't agree to go to. It's like a train being diverted to a strip club when you wanted to come to TEDx in Sussex. <laughs> <laughs> but at a totally different time, that may suit your mood per powerfully. And it's not either or. Uh, music, classical and contemporary, will always have each other and they, and they cor correlate and reference each other. Um, with nostalgia, you reference the past. This is the difference. It's referential. You reference the past. With sonics, you kind of, it's more experimental. <coughs> and you're talking about the present and the future, what's happening next, what are you doing now? With nostalgia, it's what's done before, and it's in a way limited because you're always referencing the past. With sonics, it's fertile new ground. Uh, silence becomes an instrument. There's no more rules. They fall away, allowing you to create new rules. Um, and I think it's sonically or rich experimental music has this freeing, freeing, liberating feeling which is really hard to describe because it's a new experience. And Rolf is going to talk very, very, very quickly about how we're trying to help other people with different abilities experience this feeling. About 10 years ago, I was approached because of the sound space by someone to ask if I couldn't build a, an instrument for a friend who was a, a computer player, uh, I'm sorry, a musician, a trumpet player in the symphonia, and he'd had an accident and became quadriplegic. So using using a system of ultrasonic pointer and clicker, he could play an instrument on a virtual instrument on a computer screen. Now, he's been playing in an ensemble now for 10 years, and he's also part of an organization called the British Power Orchestra, of which, to which we belong. He's the sound hound, and I'm the technical wizard, as Charles Hazel would like to say, who's the founder 
and you will come and, and hear of us during the course of this Olympic summer. Thank you.